Now, when we ended last week, we were looking at uh, chapter four, verses seven through eleven. I'll read that and I'm going to repeat some of what I said and then we'll pick back up with where we were. He says in 4, 7, 11, he says, the end of all things is drawn near. Therefore, be clear thinking and self-controlled for prayers. Above all, have earnest love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift Minister it to one another as good stewards of the diverse grace of God. If anyone speaks, do it as speaking words of God. If anyone ministers, do it as from the strength God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom is the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, I spent a fair amount of time last week on the point that with the Christ event, The end has drawn near in that the necessary grounds or basis for the eternal state has occurred. Now, since Christ's creation or since since Christ's achievement, creation has been on the verge of the end. And as long as this reality, history as we know it, as long as God grants that this will go on, it does so on the verge of Christ's return and the consummation of all things. However long he extends that time. Christ's coming is at the door. And so he then says, in light of that, see, given that life is lived on the verge of Christ's return, he commands them to be clear thinking and self-controlled for prayers. This clear thinking, I think he's saying we need to see life in accordance with God's revelation. We need to have a clear view of reality. There are all kinds of competing notions of what is true, right, how are things set up, what is the nature of reality. We need to have a clear view of that. We need to keep that in our minds. We need to see reality in life in accordance with God's revelation and have the self-control to bring to God prayers that are informed by that perspective. And the way I summarize that is we need to pray as spiritually enlightened people. So I think that's what he's saying there. And then he says, above all, we are to love one another. He says, have earnest love for one another. Love one another sincerely. But this thing about above all, it's just really important. Above all, we are to love one another sincerely, have this earnest love for one another. And he says we're to do that because love covers a multitude of sins. And it does so in the sense that it makes us more forgiving of and more patient with the sins of our brothers and sisters. And you know that. You know that when when maybe your family member or something has done something. And if there is this bond and commitment, you know... Love tends to it seeks reconciliation, it seeks peace, it seeks harmony. That's how love is inclined. So you're not looking for a reason to punish the person. You're hoping the person will repent and come. That's what you want. Hatred has the other effect. It's fragmentation, hostility, that kind of thing. So when he says love covers a multitude of sins, I think that's the sense he means. Then he commands them to be hospitable to one another without grumbling, and that's where we end it. And just let me read to you a quote from Thomas Schreiner in his commentary in the New American Commentary series. He says, hospitality was one of the marks of the Christian community. And he cites a number of texts there. Hospitality was particularly crucial for the Christian mission in a day when lodging could not be afforded. And hence, the advance of the mission depended on the willingness of believers to provide bed and board for those visiting. Cites Matthew 10, 11, 10, 40, Acts 16, 15, 3 John Verses 7 to 11. The early church was aware that such hospitality could be abused. And he cites a late first century writing that did okay. And he says, furthermore, hospitality was necessary in order for the church to meet in various homes. He cites a number of passages there referring to their meeting in homes. The words without grumbling acknowledge that those who open their homes may grow tired of the service. Hence, they are exhorted to be hospitable gladly not caving into the temptation to begrudge their charity to others. So you can see a lot of practical applications for this idea of being hospitable. That was crucial for the spread of the gospel. It was important when people are meeting in homes and this kind of thing. So he tells these Christians it's just an aspect of giving, right? It's an aspect of of using what God has blessed you with uh, in his service, So he tells them here that given that life is lived on the verge of Christ, we need to be this way. Above all, you know, you need to understand that that uh, love is crucial. Okay, and we need to be hospitable. And then then he says in verse 10 that each Christian has received a gift 
from the diverse grace of God, meaning that the nature of the gift varies. God is multifaceted. His grace is varied. And each Christian has received a gift from the diverse grace of God. And each Christian is to be a good steward of that gift. A good steward of that gift by using it in service of others. Okay, you've seen the same idea with the Apostle Paul. The notion that God has given to Christians gifts, enablements, and that we are here, he says, we are to be stewards of those gifts. And you see that God blesses Christians with differing abilities so that they may use those abilities to convey blessings to others. You see, we are to be instruments or vehicles or avenues of God's blessing to other people. So he gives us gifts, not for us, but so that we might be a passageway of his blessing for other people. So you have, you're gifted to be a conduit of God's blessing to others. And that's how you say, why doesn't he just give it to him directly? You take that up with him. You see, he has chosen, I suspect, to, to connect the body. That he has given us gifts that we might be the means of his blessing to other people. So it puts it in a different perspective when you think of it that way. See, they're given to enable us to bless brothers and sisters. You know, Paul emphasized that same theme. He reminded the Christians that gifts are given to build up and edify others, not themselves. You can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, Ephesians chapter 4. And implicit in this fact that we're stewards of these gifts is this truth that the gifts aren't self-executing. You see, we're given these gifts, but we are stewards of them. When a master gives a steward something, he gives him something. What's he to do? He's to use it. He's to manage it. He has something to do with it. He doesn't just sit here and say, I have this and I have no role with regard to this. It's not self-executing. There is something that we are to do with it. He's entrusted the Christians with these gifts, and it's our duty to use them or to manage those gifts in accordance with his will. Okay, so they're not self-executing. You can have something given to you and just say, well, I can bury it. I can sleep on it. I cannot use it. You have to use it. You have a responsibility if you've been gifted that you use it and you exercise. You use it in the way that the one who entrusted you with that gift intends for you to use it. And that is to bless other people with it and that he be glorified in it. So this is an important thing. Now, those who've been given a speaking gift, okay, those who've been given a speaking gift, which in the first century would include not only teaching, evangelism and exhortation, it would include prophesying, tongue speaking, interpreting. But he says that those who've been given a speaking gift, they're to exercise that gift with an understanding that they are speaking on God's behalf. And that's pretty heavy. You see, that they are speaking on God's behalf. See, even those speakers not delivering inspired revelations from God, like prophets, even those who aren't delivering inspired revelations from God, they are representing God to the community. Okay? They are representing God. They are speaking on God's behalf. Somebody who sits here and as we study and doing what we're doing, saying, this is the message of the Lord. Okay? Not inspired but still representing God to the community, right? Karen Jobes, she writes in her commentary in the Baker Exegetical Series, says, Therefore, those who speak must understand that they are engaged in serious business that restrains them from positing merely their own human speculation. Instead, they must speak in accordance with the revelation that God has given in the Old Testament and through the apostles of Christ, As Gopelt, as Leonard Gopelt explains, whoever passes on the gospel should be intentional about speaking, not from from narrow individuality, but from a posture of having listened to God. You see, if you're going to represent God to the community, if you're going to do that, you better have spent time listening to God because you don't like to be misrepresented. Now, I understand that we're all fallible, right? Okay, we're all fallible and we're all hacking at this and we're we're doing our best to hear. But we have to be serious about it. Right? We have to be serious about it. If you're going to speak on God's behalf to a community of people, you need to really labor to say, okay, look, Lord, this is how I see this. 
This is my best effort at pulling and understanding what you are saying. You see, we have to be very diligent in that. So when you're called on to teach, if that you, you have that opportunity, you have to take it seriously. OK, that's not to frighten people. Say, oh, I'll never teach again. I'm not good enough. And that's not not to do that. It is to get you to take this seriously and to see that when you speak on God's behalf, you don't like to be misrepresented. So you need to labor to make sure that you're doing your best not to misrepresent God. All right. And that's that's it's you and God. You're trying to express his message to people. So he, he says here that, you know, that, that he's entrusted some of them here. You see, he entrusts us with these gifts. Those that have the speaking gifts are like that. You see that they are to speak in this way as though they're representing God. And he says those who exercise one of the multitude of non-speaking gifts. I don't know, you know, all the the list that we have. I don't know that that exhausts God's gifts. You know, I look at Christians like snowflakes. I mean, God is, you know, there's there's all kinds of variety that God gives people in his diversity and how he gifts them to bless the body of Christ. And those who exercise one of the multitude of non-speaking gifts that God bestows there to do so without reservation. I think that would apply to those who exercise speaking gifts. They're not mutually exclusive. But he's speaking about those who exercise one of the multitude of non-speaking gifts. They're to do so without reservation. They're to do it with the kind of energy and effort that's worthy of the fact that God supplies the strength as well as the ability to serve in that capacity. He is giving you the strength. Right? He's giving you the strength. Now, refusing to exert strength in the exercise of a gift that he has given you is to refuse to serve as from God's strength. If he is providing you strength, you know, I was thinking of it like somebody's got bionic stuff. You got all this strength here, you sit there. I'm not going to do anything. Well, you know, I'll get tired. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, that's not serving as, you know, from this strength. God is supplying the strength, so you need to do it without reservation. You need to labor diligently, work, serve. Why? God's supplying the strength. If you put yourself out like that, you are serving as from the strength of God. Why? Because you're serving with the knowledge that God will empower me. God will strengthen me. I'm afraid I'll get tired doing this. God is the source of the strength. You see, not just sitting there and saying, yeah, I got these bionic limbs and all, and, but I'm just not going to use them. Okay, this is what that's what I think he's driving at there. Now, the purpose of using God's gifts in the way we should use them is that in all things, God may be glorified in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the purpose of our using the gifts he gives us in a way that he wants us to use them. Why are we to do that? We're to do that so that in all things he'll be glorified through Jesus Christ. You see, as God's blessings flow to people. Through our proper stewardship of his spiritual gifts, right? They are, they are, those gifts are given that we might be conduits of his blessing to other people. And as his blessings flow through us to other people, as we are proper stewards of his gifts, he is then glorified as the one who gave the gift, as the one who enabled that person to minister that way. So whatever you think of preachers, teachers and all that, you be sure That you glorify God. You see, who is the one who has given people the ability to do these things? So if there is somebody ministering to you in that capacity, well, then compliment them, encourage them, do all that. But you glorify God as the one who gives people the ability to do that. And then beyond that, he's glorified in this because what? Because as we are the conduits, as the blessings flow through the body, through these Gifts that have been given and we then take God's blessings and minister to one another. The body matures. The body grows, becomes more Christ-like. And as that happens, who's glorified? God is. As we become more and more little Christs. Christians, you see, people who reflect Jesus' character and attitude and strength and courage and commitments. And we're like Jesus. His forgiveness, his patience, all of that. Well, who's glorified in that? Well, people say, who are these people? Why are they like that? They're very different. What has happened? It's great being around them. Well, who's glorified? God is, because who is doing that? God. 
So I think when he when he says this here, the purpose of using the gifts is that we, should, we use them is that in all things, God may be glorified. That's what he's talking about. See, and he's glorified through Jesus Christ because Christ's redeeming work is the overarching context of the entire discussion in the entire letter. Right. I mean, Christ's redeeming work, his achievement, what he's done, he is the reconciler of all things. He's the focal point of everything. Okay, so when he sits here and he says, glorified through Jesus Christ. He's the overarching context of this discussion. He's the overarching context of the entire letter, the overarching context of the New Testament, the overarching context of the whole Bible. The focal point, Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. And then he says here, he says, may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom is the glory and the power forever and ever Amen. Now, that doxology, that expression of glory and praise, it could refer to either God the Father or Jesus Christ. And Peter doesn't seem bothered by the ambiguity. Right? He doesn't seem bothered by the ambiguity at all. And as Job says in her her commentary, she says, the apparent ambiguity of the antecedent of the relative pronoun, when it says to whom, well, who's that referring to? God the Father, Jesus Christ. The apparent ambiguity of the antecedent of the relative pronoun does not seem to trouble the author as much as it does modern interpreters, perhaps because he understands Christ and the Father share such praiseworthy attributes. They do, because why? He's God the Father and God the Son. So, you know, it's, it's, I guess he didn't feel the need to remove the ambiguity because the answer to the ambiguity is yes. You see, does it refer to God the Father? Yes. Does it refer to the Son? Yes. So you, you, you have that, and, he, and she adds, Job's adds, says, even though Peter's readers may feel powerless within the hostile situations they face, the doxology reminds them that all power belongs to the God they serve in the name of Christ. And you have to remember, you, these people are being persecuted. They're not living, you know, as, as we have, kind of expecting things from society and expecting, you know, we have, you, know, you have to respect us and treat us a certain way. They weren't living like that. They were living as a persecuted minority, that people were after them, perhaps drag them into court, you know, just discriminating against them, treating them poorly. And it's an important thing to to understand. And then he says in, in chapter four, verses 12 to 19, he says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you occurring to you as a test. As though a strange thing were happening to you, but insofar as you share in the sufferings of Christ, rejoice so that you also may rejoice at the revelation of his glory being overjoyed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God is resting on you. For let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed But let him glorify God in this name, for it is time for judgment to begin from the house of God. And if it is first from us, what will be the end of those who disobey the gospel of God? And if the righteous person is saved with difficulty, where will the godless and sinner appear? So then, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter tells them they're not they're not to be surprised at the persecution they're suffering. Okay, which persecution he refers to as a fiery ordeal that serves to test or to purify them. He says the same thing in chapter one, verses six and seven, that there is a function for what you're undergoing. It is not condemnation. It is not judgment in that sense of punishment. It has it is a test, the function of which is to purify that your faith might come forth and shine. You see, so he tells them that there is a testing going on here, the fiery ordeal that serves as a test to test or to purify them. Christian suffering, it is not a strange thing. It seems strange to us because we happen to be in this particular blip of history that we've, you know, ridden high, culturally speaking. I think that that wave has broken I've said that before, but we've ridden high, you see. And so this really does strike us as strange. But, you know, our Lord, it's not so suffering is not strange at all for a Christian. Our Lord suffered, right? 
That's what you have to. What happened to Jesus? How was he treated? How did the world react to him? Did they come and say, oh, I've never seen anybody so holy, so wonderful. There's nothing wrong with him. Well, some people did. But how did the world treat him? The world said false teacher, horrible person and killed him. Now, do you see what are we called? Christians. How did they treat Christ? Crucified him. So here we are, his followers, and we're thinking, hey, that's okay for you. But me, I'm riding high. See, you know, none of that's going to touch me. What? Is, our master was crucified. The world turned against him and focused its evil on him and said, we're going to be rid of him. And we, we're his followers. We're his disciples. So he says it's not a strange thing. It's not a strange thing. I mean, Jesus said in John 15, 18 and 19, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So are we surprised? Are we surprised when the world resents Christian faith resents what we say about Jesus Christ, resents our call to come and surrender to the Lord Jesus. That's stupid. What is it? What is that jump in that attack? I'm telling you what it is. It is this hostility. You see, and he says you shouldn't be you shouldn't be surprised. But Paul said in Second Timothy three twelve, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, and here so he tells him, look, look, he tells him, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you occurring to you as a test as though a, as though a strange thing were happening to you. Hey, I, I don't I don't understand this. He says, this is how it is. This is how it is. The world hates Christ. And rather than being surprised at their suffering, they should to the extent that surf, suffering is persecution for the faith and thus a sharing in Christ's sufferings. You see, it's not, pers- it's not suffering for the faith and a sharing in Christ's suffering. If you suffer as a murderer, well, you're just getting justice. If I'm a thief and they throw me in the slammer, oh, it's terrible in here. I'm sorry. Yeah, but you're suffering for justice. You're suffering as a thief. But if you suffer because of your commitment to Christ, well, then you're sharing in his sufferings. You're being persecuted for your faith. And if that's the case, he says that, see, rather than being surprised at their suffering, they should, to the extent that suffering is persecution, is a sharing in the sufferings of Christ, they should rejoice in it. Oh, man. Oh, you know, that's why I say a lot of times I say, you know, the, the, the caricature of Christianity is this kind of shallow cellophane doesn't get down to your life. And here it is. You're to rejoice as you're being persecuted because of your faith. Now, I got to tell you, that's hard. He says they should rejoice. He said they should rejoice in that persecution. They should rejoice in their being persecuted for the faith, in their sharing in Christ's sufferings. They should do that so that they also may rejoice, indeed be overjoyed, when Christ returns in glory on the day of judgment. There's a connection between the two. There is a connection between my rejoicing in suffering now for the faith and the rejoicing that I will share in when Christ returns. Now, what is the connection? The connection is, is that my ability, my rejoicing in suffering for the cause of Christ now is a function of my faith in his greatness and his glory, my faith in him as Lord is Christ, so that I see him as so wonderful that I consider it an honor to suffer for one so great. Right? Isn't that what happened in Acts chapter 5, verse 41? Tells us when the apostles were beaten by the Sanhedrin, what happened? They left rejoicing that they were what? Counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Why? It's because he's that great. It's a privilege to suffer for one that great. Okay, well, if I have that kind of conviction, that kind of faith, well, then I'm going to rejoice when he returns. Why? Because I'm a disciple of his. I'm somebody who's committed to him, who trusts him, and who has faith in his greatness and glory, faith that he is, in fact, Lord in Christ, King of kings, all of that. So I have confidence in that. Okay, well, 
What's going to be the outcome for me? Glory. You see, glory. So I'm going to rejoice greatly when he returns. Why? Because it's going to be the inheritance. It's going to be that glorious existence. It's going to be the fulfillment of all the promises, all the blessings. And so that's the connection that I think is there. In being insulted for the name of Christ, you see, they're actually blessed. Hard to see it this way. But they're actually blessed, Peter says, because the spirit of glory and of God is resting on them. See, insults motivated by their Christian living. Not by being a thief, not by being a murderer, not by that. But insults that are motivated by their Christian living, by their discipleship, by their seeking to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, nobody would be upset about that. Oh, contraire. They would. And they are. And so he says, he says, look, you know, in, in that kind of thing, insults that are motivated by their Christian living are, in fact, tributes. They are tributes that the transformative spirit is at work in their lives. If I'm being made over into the image of the crucified one, the one the world turned on, if I'm being made over into that image, what's happening now? Okay, now you see they're after me. Well, as they insult me because of my faith in Christ and my living for him, we well, see that's really a tribute, right? That's to say, okay, here, this is a vote that I see Christ in you and it makes me mad. I see Christ in you. And I don't like it any more than they liked it when they killed him. I see Christ in you and it upsets me. You see, so it's it's a tribute to the work of the transformative spirit in their lives. The spirit who is divine. He says the spirit of glory and of God. He's divine and who's also from glory. And he marks those who are bound for glory. So that's when he says the spirit of glory and of God. He is at work in our lives And so we should rejoice. You see, it's actually we're blessed when we're insulted. Now, I suspect that Peter says the spirit rests on them rather than dwells in them, which is terminology that we're more familiar with. I suspect he says the spirit rests on them rather than dwells in them because he's alluding to the Septuagint of Isaiah chapter 11, verses one and two, which is a messianic prophecy that says the spirit of God shall rest on The root of Jesse, the spirit of God shall rest on the root of Jesse. And he's he's encouraging them, I think, by saying, look, the same spirit predicted to rest on the Messiah is resting on them, implying that they can be confident. Then you see that their endurance of suffering will be a prelude to glory as the Messiah's endurance of suffering was a prelude to his glory. So he's telling him, listen, you need to understand what's at the end of this thing. I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult. And I'll say in a minute, I don't know how far we'll get. But this idea that when you become a Christian, God puts you in a bubble and nothing happens to you is just crazy. Okay? He was crucified, but you, on the other hand, mm -mm. you're too precious to have that happen to you. You're too precious to have any suffering come into your life. No, it's it's just so he's telling them here. He's talking all about this suffering that they're in. See, none of them should suffer in being punished for wrongdoing. But if they suffer as a Christian, if they suffer as a follower of Christ, they're not to be ashamed, but they're rather to glorify God in the name Christian. It's not we sit there and say, okay, you know, I'm ashamed of that. Are you one of those small minded, pinheaded people who, you know, live in a throwback reality? Uh, No, I'm not really. No. You see, not to be ashamed. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I believe Jesus is Lord. We can do with that what you want. But I believe that. And I have reasons for believing it. I didn't throw a dart at a board one day and say, let's see. I've told you this before. I remember I was in a discussion with one of my uh, partners many years ago, decades now. And I told him, I said, look, Bob, you know, I didn't just decide one day to pull a book off a library shelf and think it was inspired. I just went in just into a library, shut my eyes and threw a dart. And I said, hey, I think I'll take this book out and I'll, uh, you know, this will be the book that I'll say, hey, this is inspired. You know, and so I don't know if it ever had any effect on Robert. But all right. So this idea, see, not being ashamed, confessing 
and praising his name. And in the persecution of Christians, this is interesting to me. He says, in the persecution of Christians, God is beginning his judgment of humanity, starting from the house of God, starting from, see, he's in 17, it's time for judgment to begin from the house of God, from the temple of God, from the church. Judgment has begun of humanity. It has begun from the church. You see, and the purpose of that judgment in terms of the church is to test it. He says that specifically in verse 12, but he says that in, in verse 12, he says it in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. You see, that in ter- the judgment in terms of the church, the judgment of humanity that has begun, that has broken out first from the house of God, from the church, the purpose of that judgment in terms of the church is to test it. It is not to condemn, it is not to punish, it is to allow the genuineness and purity of its faith to come forth. It is not condemning, it is not punishing, it is a testing suffering. Whereas the purpose of that judgment, when it later falls on unbelievers, will be to condemn and punish them. You see, they are suffering and he's letting them know, listen, you know, God is in control of things. His judgment of humanity is beginning from the church. Now, that judgment that is occurring in your suffering is not a judgment of condemnation. It is not a judgment of punishment. It is a test that you're the glory of your faith, that the genuineness and purity of your faith will come forth. But there is an aspect in a phase of this judgment of humanity that has begun from the church that will be a judgment of condemnation and punishment for sin on the unbeliever. And so he's telling them, listen, this is how it is started here. If it's difficult for the righteous, if it's difficult for Christians to be saved, in what sense is it difficult for them to be saved? It's difficult for them to be saved in the sense there is suffering to endure in route to salvation, in route to the final eternal inheritance. The road, it is not that it's difficult to get in. It is that the road we travel to that is one of suffering. It's like I got a ticket to go somewhere, but you got to go this way. There's an awful lot of bumps and stuff over there. It's not that you're, well, I don't think you're welcome. It is that the journey to that inheritance, the road, okay, is one of suffering. That is what he's telling them. They are suffering. They are being persecuted. The church is persecuted. The society jumps on the church. What is that? That's how it is. And he tells them, listen, do you understand that God's judgment of humanity is broken out? But first, it is the testing judgment of the church. So, yes, there will be suffering. It is difficult in that there's going to be suffering. But listen, if it is difficult for the righteous, if it is difficult for Christians to be saved in that sense, You can only imagine the suffering that awaits the godless and the sinner in the judgment. If the road to your picking up the inheritance is difficult, if there is suffering involved in that, can you imagine what is in store for the ungodly and sinner when the judgment falls on them? You see, at that time it's going to be your Well done, good and faithful servant. You have shined forth through the difficulty and the suffering as the world persecuted and pushed you and tried to get you to sell Christ. You held faith and you you held strong and your faith shines through. Well done. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you. You see, take it. What's going to what's going to be the fate of the ungodly and the sinner? Bad. Bad. You see, can we tell people this? You see, I I consider it a disservice to conceal this from people. Got to tell them, okay? And he says this, that this is how it is. Let me me read to you a couple of quotes from uh, uh, two scholars you're familiar with by now. Paul Actemeyer, he writes in the Hermeneus series, his commentary on 1 Peter. He says, the thrust of the verse, verse 17, is to warn Christians facing situations where denial of their faith could appear to alleviate their suffering. You see, they're being pressured. They're being persecuted. Well, what's the temptation? I'm jettisoning this. What's in this for me? All I'm seeing is difficulty. 
All I'm seeing is hardship. My buddy over here who's not doing this stuff, he's getting to work. They're giving me nothing because I've been stigmatized as a Christian. He says here, the thrust of the verse is to warn Christians facing situations where denial of their faith could appear to alleviate their suffering, that such denial will in fact only guarantee that their eventual end will involve suffering far worse than any they must now endure. It is a warning to them. They're saying, listen, I understand that the road here is hard, that it's difficult. The journey to the inheritance is there's suffering involved. God's judgment, his testing judgment has broken out on mankind beginning in the church. I understand it's hard, but you need to understand that the price of apostasy, the price of turning back on Christ is going to be the judgment of the unbeliever. And if it's hard to walk that journey, can you imagine how difficult it's going to be for the ungodly and sinner? So he's telling him, listen, you need to hold. You need to hold. I don't care what happens. I don't care how strongly you're pushed. I don't care what they do to you. You need to hold. Here's how Karen Jobes puts it. So in, in 416, the motivation to faithfulness was positive, pointing out the opportunity Christians have to glorify God by remaining faithful to Christ in the midst of suffering and thereby demonstrating that God is worthy of their suffering. Here in 417 B and 18, Peter makes the negative point that those who reject the gospel of God will suffer much more than anything the Christian will endure during the hardships and persecution of this life. Therefore, it is better to suffer a little now as a Christian than to become one of those who reject Christ and will suffer much more later. You see, I don't think we're really comfortable with this kind of exhortation. But this is the Bible. This is what he's saying to them. That you need to hang on because I understand it's difficult, but you have no idea of how difficult it will be if you turn loose. You see? And that's the message, you know. I, I, that, that is something I think uh, needs to be said. Okay, let me back here and I'll just carry on to the bell rings. Now, given this dreadful consequence of abandoning Christ as implied in 17 and 18, He concludes in verse 19 with this exhortation to those suffering persecution to keep trusting in the faithful creator and keep doing good. Okay, he says it's time for the judgment again. And and if the righteous person is is saved with difficulty, where will the godless and sinner appear? So then let those who suffer according to the will of God. Do you understand this? Do Do you not think God could alleviate and take away your suffering? Do you not think he's powerful enough to take away your suffering? Do you think that he's, he's outmaneuvered or somehow? Of course he could. Well, that's what he says here. He says, who suffer according to the will of God. They're suffering. God is allowing them to suffer. He will allow us to suffer. Okay, but why are we to react to it? We're to entrust our souls to the faithful creator. We're to entrust our souls to him. We're to keep trusting in him and we're to keep doing good. So we sit and go, I don't like this. You don't have to like it. I don't like it. It's hard. It's difficult. You just be faithful. You hold on. God could stop that if he wanted. He's big enough and powerful enough. There is some function, purpose being served. You're suffering that he permits you to endure. Don't get fooled into letting go of it because then you will suffer horribly. You just endure and you keep what? You keep trusting That God is for you. He is committed to you. He is seeking to bless you. This world can sometimes challenge that perception. Where you're just going, how can it be? How can it be? Okay, so I've told you, my friend whose wife died of breast cancer and the next day his mother died unexpectedly. And he told me, he said, there are times when reason doesn't reach far enough. You try to figure that out. Okay? But you just trust. And he says, that's what he's telling him. You entrust your soul to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. That's how you treat it. You say, I'm suffering. And he knows. And then he's going to tell them shortly, you cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Thank you for coming.